Hey guys, my name is Shubham Kesriwal. Welcome back to the channel. In the last video, I announced that I will be joining the National University of Singapore um, to pursue a PhD in physics. And I asked you to post your questions. Thank you so much for all the response that you have given me. I have received quite a lot of questions. And in this video, I want to go through the most asked questions and answer them in the most elaborate way possible. Please note that I won't be able to answer all of the questions that were asked. But for those which I cannot answer in this video, I will leave a comment below your question in the last video or on Instagram. So do check those comments out. Secondly, this video might get a little bit long because well, I'm trying to answer questions more elaboratedly. So I will be giving timestamps to all the questions that I have been asked so that you can skip to the ones that you are really concerned about. Otherwise, if you are just going out for a walk or doing some cooking, any task that takes 15-20 minutes, you can just pop in your earphones and listen along. I will make sure that I don't blabber too much and stay on point. So you can just treat this as a podcast. And with that, let's move on to the first question. Which colleges did I apply to and what was their decision? All right, this is actually very funny. I applied to a total of 15 colleges, one five, out of which five were master's program and 10 were PhD programs. Since I wanted to pursue my postgraduate studies abroad, I mostly applied out of India and I applied to USA, Italy, France, Germany, well, Singapore, etc. Okay, take a guess. <laughs> How many out of the 15 institutes do you think I got accepted in? I'll give you 10 seconds. Let me see my watch. Yeah, I don't know when I started, but yeah, I think that's 10 seconds. Um, I got accepted into two out of 15 um, programs that I applied for. If you just do a rough calculation, that's about 12 to 13 percent success rate. So that should give you an idea of how competitive these programs really can get. And this is after contacting um, faculty at each one of the at least PhD programs. I contacted the faculty there, showed them my CV and asked whether they would be interested in pursuing a research project with me in case I get um, accepted at the institute. But even after that, I was accepted in only two of the uh, 15 programs I applied for. So the first program that I got accepted in was the Paris Physics Masters program. That's literally the name of the program itself um, and quite self-explanatory as you can see. Under this two year course in Paris, um, you would do one year of coursework and the next year was dedicated to research either at one of the two hosting institutes or anywhere else in Europe. The hosting institutes by the way were the Sorbonne University and the University of Paris two of the most prestigious universities. Sorbonne University, for example, ranks amongst the top 50, 55 um, institutes across the world. And so definitely this program was really prestigious and I was really excited to get accepted here. But I was still looking for a program which I wouldn't really have to pay a lot for. Having a PhD was my real goal and that was then later realized through the PhD acceptance at the National University of Singapore. So yeah, this process was really difficult for me. Um, emotionally as well because as I said I got 12 to 13 percent acceptance rate at the end and I really thought that I was prepared for something much better for some applications for example Caltech I knew I would not get in the probability of getting in is almost zero but for some other schools, I thought I really had a good chance. I, I considered them as safety schools for masters as well as for PhD programs, but getting rejected from them was really tormenting. That's why even on my LinkedIn post, when I announced that I will be going to the National University of Singapore, I mentioned that this process, which lasted about nine to 10 months, has truly humbled me. It really did. It really told me that although I thought I had everything figured out, the reality was much different. Just apply while thinking of the best, but at the same time, keep your expectations low so that you don't end up um, pulling yourself so down that you are discouraged to even um, pursue a similar path in the future. All right, moving on to the second question. What was the application process at NUS like? 
and what were the prerequisites for the same. Let me first talk about the prerequisites. I had to submit my GRE and TOEFL scores and for GRE, the physics department at least had a minimum of 320 required out of 340 in order to consider the application. So do keep that in mind that if you are applying to the National University of Singapore, you need a GRE score greater than 320, greater than or equal to for that matter. I had a score of 321. Again, got really lucky, just things had to work out and so they did. In addition to this, I also had to submit a statement of purpose, SOP, along with two letters of recommendation from uh, people that I had worked with or my faculty instructors. So how was the application process like? For me, it was a lot of waiting to do. I had received an official acceptance from the Paris program, Paris Physics Master's program back in March. So I had to really rush through my application at NUS so that I can get a final word, um, which I can then convey to the people um, in the Paris Physics Master's program. I had to ask for a deadline extension from the um, Paris Master's program about my decision whether I'm coming to Paris or not. And in the meanwhile, I had to really focus on um, pushing my application for the National University of Singapore. There are two application cycles in Singapore. One starts for the first semester, so about the August, September intake, and the other one starts for the January intake. This is the second semester intake and the one that I applied for. So the official application application deadline for this was on 15th of May but I submitted my application around the last week of April only. After that I had to wait for about a month so till the end of May when I got called for an interview round. In this interview I was asked various questions from undergraduate level physics such as from quantum mechanics, statistical physics, thermodynamics, semiconductor physics etc and also a bit about what I plan to do at the National University of Singapore so about my research topic which was in gravitational waves. Uh, among other things. And then after that I had to wait. I had to wait for a total of two months till mid-August when I finally got my official offer letter from the National University of Singapore. So yeah, the whole period starting from the mid-April when I had started my application for NUS all the way till the end of August, that whole period moved really slow for me. I could almost not feel time at all. Alright, moving on to the third question. Did I get a scholarship to pursue my PhD in National University of Singapore? And if not, how am I able to afford um, a PhD program? Well, yes, I do have a stipend associated with my PhD program. I will be offered the National University of Singapore Research Scholarship, which waives off my tuition fee at the Institute for taking any courses and additionally provides me with enough money to cover my costs of living in Singapore. Honestly, if a PhD program is not offering you a stipend, you should probably consider this as a red flag and apply somewhere else. However, of course, I do have to still cover the cost of my flight here to Singapore and along with the visa costs and initial registration costs of getting into the institute. Additionally, I would probably have to pay for my first month in Singapore because the first stipend comes in in the middle of January or towards the end of it. So for the time I will be in Singapore and the stipend hasn't been credited, I will have to live on my own money. So how to improve your chances to get into top universities? Should I prioritize CGPA or doing projects? What extra do you need to do? I put all of these questions under the same umbrella because I think I can answer them with a common tone. But I still think there are multi-level answers to this question. First of all, let us talk about the things that you can do as an undergraduate at that undergraduate level to improve your application and how you can appear to be a good student when you apply for postgraduate programs. So if you ask me whether CGPA or projects are important I'd say it's not really an either or question you have to kind of do both because your competition in India or abroad is able to do both at the same time and I have seen this happen many a times a person with no projects but with like 9.8 CGPA would have a less chance of getting into grad school compared to someone who has 8.5 CGPA but has a couple of projects, very strong projects that add a really good impact to his or her CV. So both of them are quite important. Just try to find what you are comfortable with. Try to balance between um, projects and CGPA the best you can and that should be good enough. Alright, so that was at the UG level but what can you do when you are actually applying for these positions? Um, what can you take care of? and how to make sure that you get into good colleges. Try to contact potential supervisors 
beforehand identify potential research advisors with whom you would like to work with on a particular topic mail them on their official email id tell them that you are applying for a phd position or a masters position and you would like to work under their supervision for a project many a times it would turn out that that professor is either leaving the institute or they are too full to take up new research students among a variety of reasons and under these circumstances it's better that you don't apply to that school in the first place also if you don't know your graduate application after passing through an initial screening process is passed on to the faculty of the concerned department so it might as well be that based on your statement of purpose your application has been passed on to that very particular professor who is then able to go through it and recommend you for the graduate program All right so this next question is a little bit personal but I think it's a very important question to answer it asks what are the options for masters or phd for indian students who require financial help for masters program financial aid is generally available in the form of scholarships that are able to cut a part of your tuition fee instead of giving you some money that you can utilize to live or um, buy food or something that's just because of the way that academic institutions work you can think of masters programs as the way in which university is are able to get money that they then transfer to phd students or to research being conducted at their institutes so most of the time funding is generally not available for master students and you do have to pay at least some part in your tuition fees as well as in your living expenses however with a phd the story is completely different as i said previously as well in a phd instead of focusing on coursework you are mostly engrossed in doing first hand research and producing something that will go out in the academic community so you are really putting in effort to produce something that wouldn't be there if you weren't in that particular institute and that is why i think a phd position should definitely be offering you a stipend to cover at least your living expenses another very important question how is it possible to do phd right after bsc and are there any adverse effects of skipping a masters degree this is something that i have asked myself many a times whether after my 4 years of bsc i should pursue a masters degree or should i directly go for a phd program or at least aim for that these are some things to consider first of all a direct phd is a very very competitive field and that's simply because there are very few institutes offering such an arrangement where you would be able to do a phd right after your bachelor's some examples in india are the icts the international center for theoretical sciences in bangalore and iisc the indian institute of science again in bangalore but except for them i barely know of any um, examples which let you pursue a phd directly out of india however you do have a lot of examples in the usa it's almost a norm that you are able to at least apply for a phd right after completing 4 years of undergraduate degree and in many places in europe and asia as well you are able to apply for a phd right after your undergraduate so what are some adverse effects of doing a direct phd and skipping a master degree first of all people who go for a direct phd it's not like they don't get a masters degree as part of their uh, phd degree itself they have to do some coursework and once completed once they have given an oral examination for that they are entitled to a masters degree at least and after that they can enroll in a phd after which they are actually a phd student i'd say that if you are still to discover the field that you would like to spend your time in researching um you should definitely go for a masters program at the end of your bachelors because masters provide you with an, another opportunity to explore different fields of research go through the theoretical coursework one more time and see what works for you what doesn't and based on that make a decision about which field you want to pursue in the future however if you are extremely sure about what you want to pursue going forward I don't think there's a harm in pursuing a PhD directly. Another scenario where you might still want to pursue a masters is that although you are very sure about which field you want to pursue, your fundamentals are clear, you'd still want to do a masters when you want to make your CV a little bit stronger. As I said, applying directly for a PhD from a bachelor's degree is very competitive and if you have a masters attached with it, you have another chance at improving your CGPA, improving your class rank etc. And if you are able to do all of that correctly, um the chances of getting into a phd program improve drastically and become such that you are able to get into better phd programs that you were previously being able to in the end i still want to acknowledge getting into a phd program directly after a bachelor's is extremely rare i must be stupendously lucky to be able to get into the national university of singapore so i'm really thankful for that 
All right, so we are left with just a couple more questions before the end of this video. The first one asks, what's the one thing that people don't tell you before pursuing research? Well, there are a lot of things that you will discover along the way while you do your a research project be it at an undergraduate level a postgraduate level or just some independent work done in collaboration with another professor in another institute i think the number one thing that no one told me i need to have was self discipline now what do i mean by that by self discipline i basically mean that you need to be able to do work when no one is telling you to you need to be able to get yourself motivated even when you are feeling your lowest a research work is good enough when you think it's good enough so you should have that standard of um, being able to put out good research work and all of this requires self discipline and at time this can get really daunting at time this can get really tiresome but you just have to keep pushing that's that's basically what research is honestly in my opinion research work is more enlightening than any course work ever because while providing you with the theoretical insights about a particular topic it is also telling you about your own limitations it's telling you about your strengths your weaknesses and how you can work around them in order to complete this particular research work all right so the final question asks how to start doing research on a topic of your interest man i wish i could answer that question but i myself have failed many a times in trying to do exactly the same now at this stage i think i would be somewhere close um in trying to do the stuff that i really really enjoy but in the early days in like my first or second year um as an undergraduate i always kept thinking about working on gravitational waves or at least in astrophysics but opportunities were just not available around me so i had to make do with whatever was available so my first internship for that matter wasn't even in astronomy or astrophysics the first internship i did was in quantum computation at iit bhuvaneshwar as an internship i mean i just got started somewhere that project it wasn't useless because it did give me a lot of insight about how to do literature review on how to write an academic paper etc and i'd recommend you to do the same just go out for the opportunities that you have at this point and sooner or later you will fall into that one subject that you really like and want to pursue in the future even if you don't pursue the topic that you had originally planned to pursue you will end up doing a topic that you now really love and really care about and and can do research for the rest of your life on So yeah that's basically it again i'm sorry for the questions that i wasn't able to take up in this video i tried to keep the questions revolving around research work or postgraduate studies and i have mostly ignored all the questions that were given re regarding bachelor's degree etc i try to answer them again as i said in the comments below so do check them out but for now i should probably end this video and go drink some water um thank you so much for watching my name is shubham kejriwal and i'll catch you guys in the next one